Um, today's topic is going to be on portraiture, and I hope you'll forgive me, I'm getting over a cold. So I'm going to try and hold the microphone away when I cough. <laughs> but anyway, I'm joined here by these wonderful portrait artists. Um, so let's go down the line and introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Elizabeth McGee, and I'm booth 97 here. Hi, uh, this is Pega Pegas Amway. Uh, it's my first year in uh, Art Festival. Hello, uh, my name is Echo Baker. My uh, booth number is 109. I'm also here for the first time at the festival. And I'm Lonnie Emanuel. And what's her name? Oh, uh, name's booth number, oh. booth number 38. So a lot of us, like, I've, I've been here for a while now, but it's kind of cool to see more portrait artists come into the show because it used to be more of an outlier thing. So now we almost have, like, a club going, which is cool. Um, and then uh, I moved here to Laguna Beach to go to Laguna College of Art and Design, or LCAD, and uh, after graduating, I decided to apply here. My great grandma was a portrait artist and she showed here in the 50s. And so after I applied, got in and I've been here ever since. Um, so let's find out a little bit about your academic training, um, what schools you went to or even ateliers and uh, uh, just education background before we get into the meat. I moved to the U.S. Uh, around 2010, and uh, I started uh, academic, you know, painting and drawing in a school, LCAD, and I graduated um, 2014, and I'm still in school for MFA program. I'm completing, so the MFA around uh, next year. I went to Chatna University um, 32 years ago. I came over as an international student from China. I came over to do my master's in English, and after I finished that, I thought, well, maybe this is a chance I can finally pursue arts. So I went back to get my bachelor's in art at Chatna University. Um, it was a great experience. And um, I did a lot of self-training, too. And um, I went to uh, some workshops with some master artists, such as um, Morgan Weisland, uh, Nian Setu, um, David LaFell, over the last 10 years or so. And uh, my beginnings were that I was a fashion designer for 15 years up in Los Angeles and uh, stopped to have a family, got bored with being a stay-at-home mom and took an art class and that was 23 years ago. I have my BFA from Art Center College of Design in Pasadena and five years of Los Angeles Academy of Figurative Art um, just doing uninstructed workshops, just three-hour portrait studies, uh, and kind of killing time until my youngest went away to college. And then I moved down here and did my master's degree in fine art painting at Laguna College, uh, where I now teach. And uh, that's it. Long road. A lot of portraits. Cool. So um, one of the first questions that I wondered from you, because we all work kind of differently, is how do you go about capturing a likeness? Because we're not cameras, you know, and uh, sometimes there's this thing that happens when you see a photo of your own face and you go, ew, I don't look like that, you know? But then if you, it's interesting where an artist will take the literal representation and if you see a painting of yourself, it's like, oh, or a painting of another person you know, it's like that looks more like the person than the photograph. So how do you go about getting that kind of not literal 
I mean, you have to do measuring and stuff, but I mean, how do you go about capturing that light, that likeness, that spark of a person? So for me, uh, I'm working from photography for all my portraitures and uh, for my still lives, I'm working live, but uh, I, I have actually secret. So <laughs> I usually print the black and white, same size, the portraiture I want to work. And I always keep it inside, and I always refer at that. So for, you know, for um, size and for also the like shadow shapes or lightness, for yeah, everything I refer to that one, and uh, I think it works for me. Yeah, for for lightness especially. Um, to me, um, I think life painting or drawing practice, regular practice is most important and the most beneficial. Um, when I paint a portrait, I would like to usually start with life painting if possible. Uh, I've been keeping up my regular life painting practice uh, for the last over 10 years and I can see how much I improved from doing that. Um, as far as the likeness, when I paint a portrait, I think the proportion is very important of the facial features and the relationships of the facial features. Um, you know, everyone is a little different, but I go for the most uh, captive or strongest feature of that subject. Uh, to emphasize that part instead of uh, just generally emphasizing every part of the, the portrait. Uh, I think if you capture that most distinctive feature or expression of that person and then you, you get you get essence of that person. Um, to me that's the most important part and um, I'm when I'm painting I'm depicting or describing what I see with the paintbrush. So I think once you get the technical part right, the proportion, all that, uh, the last part I call the fourth dimension is the essence of that person. That, I think it ha you have to, it's, it's not completely um, under control, but uh, it, you put in your own life experience and your own personality, all those things have something to do with how you describe what you see. So I spent many, many years uh, painting from life with a model in front of me. Unfortunately, it's you know three hours, four hours, five hours if you're lucky. And so I just kind of developed my chops of getting a likeness very quickly um, and catching something of their personality. When I came down here to do the master's program, I wanted to do larger figurative pieces but still hold that sense of portraiture uh, within the piece. And so because these take two, three, four months to paint, I was forced to use photography. At first, it really discombobulated me because the camera can't see what our eyes can see. But once I just said to myself, you know what this is, you know what this looks like, I'm like, okay. I can just like look at the photograph for the proportions, put it away, and paint the person that I know. And so I work with my model in a photo session that I, I kind of treat it almost like a fashion photo shoot. I have them bring clothes, their favorite clothing, accessories, etc. We do wardrobe changes. And during that hour, I, I ask a million questions. I'm very nosy. I get to know them. And I observe their um, kind of their body language and their facial expressions and so forth. So I go through about 400 photos. It takes me a couple to find that one that has the magic, that has, like Echo said, the essence of that person and what it is that I want to say about that person or work with. So once I've found 
that particular image, then I'm off to the races. Yeah, I, I do something similar because uh, when I was in school, I worked a lot from life, but just the cost of having a model, you know, is just so prohibitively expensive, especially since I have a day job. So I, I do the same thing with my models who pose for my series where I have them come to my studio and I give them the props, but I tell them they can wear whatever they want because I like capturing personality. And if you give someone a costume, they're somebody different. They're almost a combination of you and them. And so I'll, I'll take a long series of photos, 50 to 100. And uh, when I find one that I like, you know, because most of my models I know, so it's like, oh, it's easy to go, oh, that looks most like her. That one looks most like him. Um, then what I do is I tend to then send the image to the sitter, even though it's not a commission, and be like, okay, if you could change three things about this, what would you want to change? because they know themselves better than I do. And I figure, okay, three minor changes, that's not a big deal. So sometimes my sitters will say, oh, fix right here. And I'll joke, oh, sure, no problem. Cheaper than plastic surgery and it lasts longer. So <laughs> the, the paintings still end up looking like them, you know, but it's their best to them, you know? So sometimes uh, I'll have requests for getting rid of like smile lines. And it's like, well, if you get rid of those, people look creepy because you're like actually destroying anatomy. Um, so those I won't change, but like little minor things I have no problem doing. Um, but yeah, because I love capturing individuality. And on that note, um, let's talk about each of our series is about our work that we have up here and kind of the inspiration behind them so that uh, the audience can kind of know that some of these are part of the series, that they're not just commissions where it's just a representation of a person. Yeah, my uh, the series of work, I'm uh, recently working on, I, I call it the bird, uh, and it's for me because uh, all my paintings are about my background, uh, and I was born in Iran, and I grew up there, and uh, I'm talking about my experience as a woman in, their, in that culture, and I'm talking about gender discrimination, and uh, what women feel in that society and in that culture, and yeah, I, I call myself uh, like the representational artist and because I'm represent I'm one of the representers actually from that culture from Iran and I'm talking about uh, what women you know feel or experience in that culture. Oh. For this particular um, painting, I ask a friend, and she's uh, one of my friends. I asked her to sit for me because I met her. I thought we have some similarities in a lot of outlooks on things. So I like her, and um, she's a fashion designer. Uh, I do that sometimes if I see a friend or someone I feel like drawn to them in some way, I like to paint them and I'll ask if they can sit for me. So I did this painting um, live. She sat for me for the first three hours and I took some photos and I finished the painting with uh, the photo references. Um, interestingly, um, many visitors here at the festival ask if that's me. I said, I'm flattered that she's much younger than me. <laughs> well, somehow, um, I guess that's how it goes. Sometimes you paint a portrait, you, uh, your own personality is somewhat, that's related to the, the later question. Uh, you, uh, your own personality uh, shows a little bit in the painting itself, but she doesn't look like me or anything. So this painting is one of a series of paintings that I did during my time at uh, Laguna College in the master's program. I had to come up with a concept for my thesis body of work and thesis paper. My daughter had just gone away to college and I had just moved down here and I was missing her terribly. So I was kind of just thinking about her adolescence and 
comparing it to my adolescence and how very different they were, but how we both used fashion as a means of self-expression and kind of experimentation with like who we are as, as people and, and who we want to be. So I began the series using um, just young women that I found round and about. Um, so I had, right after I graduated, I had a big solo show at my dream gallery up in Los Angeles. And I titled the show, She's Becoming. Um, because it's kind of the essence, and my mouth, my thesis was also titled She's Becoming, because the women that I'm painting, they're not children anymore, they're not little girls, but they're not quite full-on women just yet. They're sort of becoming women, and I, I find that age range, like say 14 to 18 or so, just fascinating everything that we as women go through um, in, in our process of, of maturing. And so uh, I just continue painting this. I've been painting this series for about uh, five years now. Awesome. Yeah, I've been working on this series of portraits I've been calling uh, Mythica. So it's all women of Greek mythology, but modernized. Um, I've been working on it since 2012, and I had a goal of 80, and I'm at 43, so <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> but it's, it's fun to paint real people, because I think too often with mythology, like when you think of goddesses, they all look like Victoria's Secret models with the wind blowing behind their hair. And one of the interesting things that I have learned from studying mythology, or specifically Greek mythology, my mom's a Latin teacher and a Greek classicist, so I kind of couldn't avoid learning about it. But um, <clears throat> sorry. But one of the things that always fascinated me was that uh, the gods and goddesses were not better than mortals. Like if someone called you a goddess, that wasn't necessarily a compliment. They were almost like Tinkerbell in the original Peter Pan, where she was so small, she only had enough room for one emotion at a time. And so the gods and the goddesses were kind of like that. They were a distilled single emotion. They were incapable of compassion at times um, and so they in a way are aspects of humanity but distorted and so I wanted to take that and to paint real people well-rounded people but as gods and goddesses so not idealized at all but just real you know so most of my models are local people or people who I meet who volunteer um, so then that way I can get a, a broad range of people to paint. So I, my old painting mentor used to tell me that any artist is just 80 10-hour head drawings away from being a master. And so I was like, 80, that sounds good. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm almost there. Um, now leading on to the, the, the question that Echo hinted at, um, some people say that you can see a part of an artist <coughs> in a painting. Um, whether it's that they physically look like them or just their personality. And so does that happen in your work? And if it does, um, are, you, oh, are you intrinsically aware of it or do you have people point it out to you? I'm not sure for this question. <laughs> yeah, for me, um, I think, you know, personality or the team I'm working on is really close to my life. And yeah, I think each piece of painting I'm working is really related to what I experienced in the past. But for likeness, <laughs> I don't think so, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess I mentioned that already. Uh, I think every piece of work we do has our own footprint or stamp, uh, invisible stamp there, um, which is good in a way, or, or unavoidable. Uh, it's not intentional, but uh, it's we pour heart and soul to a piece of work. It's uh, impossible that uh, your personal, your inner uh, something is not in the painting. Um, I think that adds the depth to, to a portrait. 
Um, yes, I, I agree with what everyone is saying. And um, in my very early days of just kind of learning how to portrait paint, for some reason, all of my models ended up with these round moon faces. <laughs> and it was pointed out to me a few times by my instructors and so forth. It, it, you, you almost can't help it. It's like you look in the mirror every single day and you see your face <coughs> shape. And then when you're faced with a live person, you're just like, okay, the face is that shape. Um, I got past that. I got past that. So I, you know, sitting in my booth and people looking at my work, oftentimes I get the question, is that your daughter? Is that your daughter? God, that looks like you. That's, is that your daughter? And I'm like, no, none of these are my daughter. But I think um, not their visual appearance, but I think something about uh, the concept that I bring to my work is very much, you know, what I'm thinking about and what's inside of me. So, uh, yeah, conceptually, yes. Uh, actual anatomy portrait wise no it looks like the person i'm painting now on that note of looking in the mirror i notice i have a tendency to paint people's noses like me so it's like i'll start on a portrait i'll have everything measured out and you know mapped in and then if i'm lazy and not looking at my reference i'll just go okay nose time you know and it's like oh that's not their nose that's my nose you know because i see it all the time um, and so I actually have to try not to do that. And sometimes I think it still happens where like a physical likeness gets in. Like I have a painting up in my booth with a girl with an umbrella. And people go, oh, wow, is that a self-portrait? It's like, no. Is she your sister? No. Did you do that from your head? No. <laughs> so it is interesting where even with a physical likeness or like you guys were saying, where it's like just the artist's own individual fingerprint, where if you look at any of our paintings, you even though they're all representational, they all have their own flavor. Like how we all see reality pretty similarly, but how we interpret it is, can be very different. And I find that fascinating. Um, and then let's go over like, uh, which artists have influenced your work um, and have inspired you, whether they're uh, still contemporary living artists or artists of the past? For me, um, it was Dutch artists, you know, from the past, like uh, master, master artists. And I highly influenced by uh, Ramia and Barbara because of the purple lighting they used to, um, to bring out the focal point. And I always, uh, for all my models, uh, I try to have like very proper lighting to bring actually or to point my focal points in all my paintings. Yeah, and yeah, really my highly yeah influence is like Vermeer. Yeah, I love his voice and influence of him. Well, um, I admire a lot of artists' works past or present, particularly um, the 19th century Russian artists, um, Repin and um, Kromskoy and Fashin, uh, to name those few. And the contemporary artists are, uh, like I mentioned, uh, Mansi to John Howard Sandon and uh, Morgan Weisman. Um, I admire those portraits particularly by a Ripin, the Russian artist, because um, his portraits, his figurative paintings and portraits are just not image. It's, it's beyond image. It's much deeper. Uh, there's substance under the image. It's the person. Um, you, you see the whole person inside and outside through the, the painting. Uh, I like to describe a uh, ripping and the, those Russian artist paintings are like a visual literature. You can read, you can create a story by looking at these images. So I'm very much inspired by that aspect. I try to portray, paint my portraits um, that way. Uh, I'm also 
very much into literature. I've read a lot of uh, novels. So I like to have my paintings to tell a story, to make people uh, see what they can see from underneath that image. I have uh, three, I mean, I, I love, I love many, many, many artists' work and style and so forth, but I have three main artists that I have influenced my work. Um, the first is John Singer Sargent. He did, uh, he lived about 110, 20 years ago or so, and he did society portraiture, um, women and children and men and so forth, but he also painted um, other artists and writers and people that he knew. And there was a distinct difference, I think, between how he painted non-society versus how he painted society. And so, but basically, I'm very drawn to how the face is the most important thing. The face is always the focal point. And then the clothing and whatever else there is in there is a little looser. If you ever study his paintings, the faces are really polished out. The clothing and furniture and so forth is looser because he doesn't want the eye going there. He wants the eye going right to the face, um, which I'm generally conscious of when I'm uh, working on my painting. The second one is uh, an artist by the name of Anders Zorn. He lived around the same time as John Singer Sargent. And he very, very much influenced my color palette. He worked with a very limited palette, four tubes of paint. Occasionally he would throw in a fifth if he had a specialty color. And that's how I work. I actually adopted his color palette of just black, white, yellow ochre, and cadmium red. Occasionally I'll throw in a specialty color for socks or ducks that, that I just can't get with the basic colors. And then thirdly, um, like Echo, Vermeer is uh, also one of my big influences uh, for the way he painted light streaming across a wall. And you have the sense of interior atmosphere. I painted plein air for many years, so I'm very adept at painting uh, like landscape atmosphere, but inside a room there's also atmosphere, so the air between me and the sitter or between you and the sitter, I take that into consideration. So atmosphere, a sense of light streaming across a wall, that's, that's what I love about Vermeer and that's what I've adopted into my work as well. Now, one of the main influencers in concept for me uh, is an Italian, uh, well, really Spanish artist who moved to Italy, Giuseppe de Ribera. Um, not for subject matter, but he was doing these paintings of the saints, but grotesque. And so, and the time period where saints were idealized, he was painting them with dirty fingernails and missing teeth. And so that's like almost sacrilegious, but the idea that, no, nah, if someone was alone in the desert for 40 years, <laughs> without proper hygiene, they're not going to look like they've just had a perm. And uh, so each of these characters are very individualized. And uh, another big influencer was Rembrandt, who I'm sure most of you know about, because he was also painting biblical subjects, but in his own time periods clothing. But us now, 400 years later, looking back, it looks like, oh, wow, yeah, those robes, you know, yeah, that's, that's what I think of when I I think of biblical times, but it's like, nope, at the time it was like that was as weird as going, oh yeah, this is a, a goddess, you know, but in a, a modern day sweater. So those have been uh, real influencers for my direction, but uh, same as Pega said, it's I love the Dutch painters, and um, with Dutch society, they became very wealthy very quickly, so they kept a lot of their more low down roots, they weren't hoity-toity, they didn't even have high society for the first uh, few uh, centuries uh, when they became very wealthy. So they really would just do portraits of individuals where the individual was what was beautiful and wearing just black or maybe some white lace to show that they were important. Um, and so 
I, I love painting just individuals and glorifying the individual, even all their flaws and everything like that. Um, and then also wanted to ask, uh, do you accept commissions? And then if you do, what is just a brief overview of, a, of, a, of how you would approach the process of a commission? Uh, yeah, but um, I, I usually, you know, I always prefer to take photo myself, you know, of my models because, you know, I sometimes had experience that people came to me with like small pictures, <coughs> you know, it's pretty hard to add more details, especially they, they expect I finish like, you know, <laughs> very detailed painting and it's pretty, pretty hard. And uh, yeah, I always offer my customers, I, I take photo and yeah, and, um, yeah, I, I usually take photo of my models and it takes like two, three months to, I start with like mini sketches and if they like the composition and everything and they, I, I start to paint, but I'm really slow, but uh, I, I really need time because I want to have like more, you know, like emotional, you know, connection with my paintings. I don't want to, you know, finish goes, you know, very really fast and I really need time. I, I just tell everyone if you need size painting it's gonna it takes like two three months at least to finish the piece but yeah it's overall <laughs> yeah. uh yes i have been doing commission painting portraits particularly for years um and i love doing that because uh, painting portraits that's um what i do mostly um it's if possible, I would tell my um, clients that uh, I would like to meet them if they're local. Uh, I, I do think it has something to more than just uh, painting from a photo, but if possible, I would like to meet the person I'm going to paint and get to know them a little bit or as much as I can. If not possible, I would um, ask for a good quality photo or several photos references. Um, also, uh, if possible, I would like to take my own photos to meet the person I'm gonna paint, uh, to take my own reference photos. So I go from there, I ask the clients if what their uh, idea is for a portrait they want me to paint, and then I share with them my idea and then we usually, uh, you know, agree, um, that's basically the, the process. Usually, yes, I ask for two months at least, depending on the size of the picture, uh, two months of time to, to complete a smaller size, like 12 by 16 uh, inches. Larger ones will take longer. Um, but. Um, Yes, that's um, what I love to do. I was faced with the most challenging photo years ago um, that a friend of mine, book club friend, wanted me to paint so she could give it to her husband for Valentine's Day. It was his favorite photograph. It was of him on a boat holding his five-year-old son with a beautiful sunset in Waikiki with diamond head in the background. The skyscrapers were like super, super bright. And, and the, uh, her husband and her son were so dark, they were almost black. And so I'm like, sure, I can do this. And it really took a lot of adjusting uh, the, the light balance and toning down what was going on behind them and almost inventing what was going on with their clothing, like a dark navy blue windbreaker on the sun and this wild pattern Hawaiian shirt on the husband. So it took me, I wanna say it took me six months 
when I did it and she was so happy and her husband was beyond beyond happy because this was his favorite image their son was at that point uh, 16 so I couldn't even you know dress up the, the son with a jacket because in the photo he was five uh, and she was so happy that she gave me a little black and white photo of her parents in their wedding clothes and I did it larger and I invented the color which I kind of took just from observing her and her skin tone and so forth and so that's kind of how I got you know the skin tone colors on on a black and white I prefer taking the photos myself for this very reason um, either in my studio or I like going to a client's home because when they're in their own environment, they kind of become, they're more relaxed and they just kind of become who they are. And we can kind of get creative as to where they're sitting. And I bring lights if the lighting isn't, you know, what I want it to be for a portrait. Um, and uh, they take a few months, they take a few months, depending on the size and the complexity. And I think there's a quote, I think Sargent said it, but correct me if I'm wrong. Every time I paint a portrait, I lose a friend. And I just thought that was hilarious because um, I do commissions, but the commissions I prefer to do are part of my Mythica series. And so I have the models pose for it. Most of them are volunteer, but when it is a commission, I'll say, hey, if it's part of my Mythica, you know, no money up front, and you just sign this thing saying that I can sell it if you don't want it. So then that way when it's done, you know, if you don't like it, cool, that's, that's all right. You know, someone else will love it. And so far, each one of those commissions, they have found their home. Um, but I found that that is a less stressful way of, of doing commissions. Because sometimes if a person won't explicitly say what they don't like about how they look, it's like I can't read their mind. Like if they're sensitive about something, um, like I've noticed when I do portraits uh, or when I take my own photos, because I love taking my own photos for all these reasons that were just mentioned, um, that there are like tricks for taking photos that are flattering but not lying. So uh, if someone has a larger nose, don't do three quarter, do straight on. Um, when I did a self portrait, I'm not Quasimodo, but my features aren't perfectly symmetrical. Like my sisters are like models, but it's like, eh, whatever. So when I did my self-portrait, three quarters, and my neck's pretty good. So I made sure to show a lot of neck. So there's, you know, they always say show your good side. Um, and then an interesting thing that I heard from one of my friends, she said, if you're ever in a photo and your hands are going to be in it and you don't like how the back of your hands look, she says, hold your hands up over your head for 10 seconds, all the blood drains out of the veins, and then for another 10 seconds, you have gorgeous hands. And I'm like, I am keeping that note. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so for, for me, I've uh, commissions aren't my mainstay, uh, mostly because I am stubborn, and I like, you know, working on what I'm working on. But as a working artist, you know, it's like it's great to have support, you know, where someone goes, no, I, I want you to paint me or I want you to paint my wife or my daughter. And then they get to be part, you know, of art history, which, you know, a lot of people forget, like if you have a photo, I mean, unless it's by a professional photographer, you know, um, a photo is just a representation. But like a painting, it's connected to the time and place it was painted to the life of the artist, because we really do put pour our whole lives into our paintings and then also the person so when you go to a museum and you see portraits of people you know it's not just oh this is duke so and so and so and so it's like the there's the artist what was he or she going through when they were painting the portrait what was the politics going on in the background what does this say about the larger world so as artists we are kind of condensing all those ideas into a painting of a figure, not only just by the how the person looks, but how we choose to represent them, what we choose to include, um, which I just think is so cool. <laughs> That's why I'm a painter. Um, and then one last thing, since well, we didn't go over it, we're all oil painters, but maybe just briefly go over your process. Like, do you do lots of layers or a la prima, um, just to kind of give the audience an idea of what we do. For me, uh, I start with, like, you know, I usually have dream of my painting, so 
I translate, uh, uh, yeah, I transfer them. So in like just with graph, I can solve just mini sketches. And then um, later, if I really make sure that I want to paint them, so I uh, photography that setting exactly that setting, and uh, then uh, I transfer. I start to draw and then transfer on the. Um, I I started to paint on aluminum or plastic sheets, and because they have like very very smooth surface, and then uh, I start to paint. I start with um, Bersiana wash at the first, and then it's dry and. I start one coat, and if I need the second coat, and uh, sometimes I really, you know, finish the piece with two coats. But yeah, sometimes for my laces especially, so I go two, three, or sometimes more than five coats to exactly have the effect of laces, and also to blow up know the lightness on the laces so yeah and um, recently I uh, switched to uh, national pigments it's pretty expensive you know but for the lead whites there are really works for my laces and, <coughs> um, yeah and I'm really happy on my last last layer I use lead white for Vermeer and it's um, I think it's number two. Yeah, and it really works for on, on my last layer for my laces. Yeah. Um, depending on what I paint for studio, a uh, three-hour uh, practice, I pretty much just go a la prima, one layer, because uh, of the time. Uh, just three hours you um, when I finish and then it's finished but for a uh, more serious projects like a uh, commissions or other projects I do um, I will start with um, a drawing uh, especially if it's a multi-figure painting I would uh, start with drawing because the you know the form is very important to me the proportion everything perspective has to be right uh, before you put paint on it uh, so after I do the drawing I'm happy with the drawing and I start uh, putting the underpaint uh, which means uh, dark always one one color usually it's a, a sienna burnt sienna uh, uh, monochromatic for underpainting and then when that dries I start uh, using colors, usually st starting from um, dark to the light, um, dark, medium, and light. So that can take many coats. Uh, for large painting, uh, you have to work in one area at a time and then move on to the next. And then when the earlier area dries and then you go back and you see so all your, all your paints dry slowly uh, and then they look a little different sometimes when when the paints are dry and wet so that that's part of the reason it takes time uh, you go back after it's dry and you go back to see if it looks right um, and then you put another coat uh, mixing color uh, is, is very tricky uh, that's probably to me, I think, uh, the most challenging part for oil paintings. It's not the likeness of the person, it's, a, it's a mixing color. It takes a lot of time and takes a lot of codes uh, to, to finally finish a painting the way that uh, you want. Uh, I trained uh, painting from life, so. I, I learned uh, just painting the all prima method, not even doing a drawing with pencil, just like a little thinned out paint, doing the drawing, throwing the painting on pretty uh, thickly and ending up with um, a pretty decent portrait study. Um, and I kind of uh, do that with uh, this larger work as well, but I, 
I get at the drawing either with charcoal or a pencil, spray it with a sealer so it stays put while I'm painting. And then I go in pretty directly with my colors, getting as accurate as I can with the colors in the drawing. And I do two, oftentimes three or four layers of paint to refine and refine if I need to change something or I have another idea. Like originally she just had a, a concrete floor and I felt like it needed something further. So I drew in a checkerboard floor and I'm like, well, it still needs something. So I photographed some ducks probably 30 photos of ducks until I got the right arrangement of the ducks and so forth. And so it's um, layers and layers until it's saying what I want it to say and looking how I want it to look. Yeah, I'm, I also do the alla prima technique, but I'm a weirdo. I do the drawing, so it almost looks like a very simple coloring book, not like one of these adult coloring books where it's just like so many lines. It's like just enough to know, okay, here's where the, the eyeballs are, here's where the nose is, here's the line for the mouth, but I won't even draw the lips. I'll do that with the paint. But um, I mix clove oil medium with my oil paint so that it stays wet for a very long time. And when I'm not working on a portrait, I put them in like under bed plastic storage containers, like big Tupperwares. So sometimes I, I, they, they look like a bunch of coffins in my studio because there's all these people laying down in them. <laughs> but um, that keeps the dust off them while they're still wet. Um, and then I blend and paint mostly with watercolor brushes. Um, occasionally I'll, I will glaze. Um, when I first started this series, I was like, no, I'll la prima all the way. That's all I do. But now I, I, for different textures I've been discovering, Glazing has its merits, you know. So especially for like clothing textures or hair textures, um, I, I will glaze. But I find for flesh tones, for me, I'm the most comfortable working uh, blended alla prima. Um, and then I paint on a wood panel because I don't like the bumps on canvas. Like as soon as you get close, it like ruins the illusion. And so for me, that's why I switched over. But when I do bigger paintings, I work on canvas and I squeeze on extra gesso and then put a squeegee over it so that it fills in all the little bumps and then you have to sand it a whole bunch. Um, but yeah, if every artist has their own process and that also contributes to the uniqueness of the work. No one, there is no right way to do it, you know, and even now I'm still figuring out new ways. I'm going, ooh, I didn't know that would be so cool. So. Maybe I'll learn something from you guys. <laughs> so I'd like to open it up to any questions you may have. So any questions you have, I'll repeat them in the microphone. So the question was, how do we decide what props are in our paintings? Where it's like, why the bird in the cup? Why the teacups? Why the rubber duckies? Um, so uh, I guess I'll answer first, and then we'll each go down and explain. So like for me, it's symbolism. So like this is Hebe, who was the cup holder of the gods. So she carried around this magical cup, and that uh, it had a liqueur where if the gods drank it, they would never age. So she was always on call. You know, if Athena saw some wrinkles, take a sip, you're good. And uh, Zeus also gave her uh, a griffin, you know, like a, a magical bird. And so I represented it by the girl who posed for this. This is her actual parakeet. So it's like it has the symbols of the story, but it's not the story. For me, uh, cops are a symbol of um, women. And they are fragile, but they are beautiful. And um, they are, uh, for this painting, they are arranged as a planet, and uh, they are orbiting around her, and she's holding sun or life, and the flower is symbol of life, and uh, it's the part of universe, uh, or it's the heart of universe, <laughs> and um, cups together, and she and everything is like for me are symbol of women, and they are all together. And, um, yeah. Uh, for this particular painting, um, 
Well, usually I I try different things with the model or the subject. Uh, see what、um, props can complement the theme of this、uh, proch- portrait I want to、uh, paint. Maybe something、uh, the the subject likes or thinks is important.、Uh, for this one,、uh, she's a fashion designer, and the the dress she's wearing、uh, was designed by her. It was an award winning、uh, design, so she's very proud of it. So I said that's what she should wear. So and I have her wear that and the, the chair,、uh, the red. Antique chair and goes with the with the picture、uh, with also the screen that I have in my studio. I thought、uh, makes a good composition. So usually you just try different props.、Uh, you basically you have some idea of what you want to to do with the portrait, or how you want to paint it, and then you try different things, see which one works out the best. And for me, the ducks came about as、um, a secondary、uh, thought. I had her painted originally, like I said, with just a concrete floor, and I wanted to bring a little more concept to it. I also felt like I wanted a little bit more punch with my composition, and I wanted a little more punch with the color. So, for three reasons,、uh, it ended up being rubber duckies. She's got a tiara. The title is "To Be a Princess," so I'm thinking, okay, a princess really needs her loyal subjects. The socks, even just the socks, weren't enough color, so I said, okay, it needs to be something like a pop of color to kind of anchor that corner. And compositionally, the focus I have two two focal points.、Uh, her face is. First or second, depending on who's looking, focal point with the ducks as a second focal point, and then the diagonal of the leg, taking your eye back and forth between her face and with the tiara and and the ducks. So, got the ducks in a row, and they're adoring her. You see the looks on their faces. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yeah. So the question was, who was the first face or the first portrait you ever did?、Um, well, for myself, probably my mom or my dad. There's a picture on my mom's refrigerator to this day in crayon.、Um, every time she's moved, she's packed it up with the kitchen stuff and put it back on the refrigerator. And I've told her, you know, I, I could do you a better one, <laughs> but no, it's it's still up there.、Um, so yeah, for me, I mean, I started drawing when I was a kid. I didn't. Like doing it when I was older, but yeah, that was probably my my first. For me, my father.、Um, I don't quite remember. <laughs> I started drawing faces、uh, at an early age. And my friends、uh, they would、uh, just sit there. I would just draw their faces, and they just loved it. And then later on, I guess I started with self portraits. And my kids, when they were young,、um, and but I haven't done a lot of portraits of my family because somehow they don't like to sit for me. I do. My I kids, when they when they were they're now they're in college, when they were their teens, they agreed to sit, but they were playing video games. That's that's how he they could sit still, and I have to pay them a little bit money for them to stay there for two hours. <laughs> Because I didn't want to use photo, I said, "You're here, sit for me." <laughs> But now I did my parents, of course, and my husband, who didn't like to sit for me either. So I don't really have a good for- portrait of my husband. Someday I hope I will. <laughs> so the first portrait I painted in oil. I'm not counting crayons and pencils and all the all the kid stuff, or even like the stuff I did as a fashion designer. So. As an oil painter, the first portrait I did was the wife of an artist I was studying with, and she was young, and she would come in and model for us and so forth. It was so stressful. I felt 
like I had to get it looking exactly, exactly like her or shame would rain down on me. Um, but I was, you know, I was only beginning and so looked a little bit like her. But since then, I mean, I've, I've painted my kids and did a couple of miserable self-portraits and just family and friends. So any other questions before we wrap it up? Yes. So the question was, have you ever tried to do a portrait of a family pet? Um, yes, I painted my cat and it was easier because a cat doesn't have an opinion on what he looks like. <laughs> I haven't, yes. I, oh, I have two birds, so I've done a um, few paintings of my birds, of course, from photos. They constantly move. I do sketches sometimes to get familiar. But yeah, I've done uh, paintings of my two cockatiels. I attempted a painting of uh, one of my cats years ago who was taking a nap in the sunshine and I got halfway through it and the cat woke up and walked away. And that was it. <laughs> well, I want to thank you all for coming to this week's Art Talk and thank you all for being on the panel. And thank you, PBS SoCal, for sponsoring the event. Uh, next week, uh, the topic will be pageant light and magic. So it'll be a behind-the-scenes look at uh, what goes into making the pageant. So I even just love attending it you know, as an audience member because I always learn something new. So thank you all for coming, and hope you have a wonderful week.